um, who in some sense we might say is kind of uh, the one of the sort of stimuli, if that's a, if that's a word, to to the to the very existence of the diplomacy and, and culture stuff because um, a, a number a number of years ago um, when I was first starting to work on ambassadors I had published a, a, a somewhat incoherent article on this topic and I was struggling away trying to m make sense of some of my own work on diplomacy and she sent me an email and said I'm coming to Berkeley and I read what you wrote could we have coffee. And it was great because A, not only had she read what I'd written, but <laughs> she, she remembered it. And she was basically able to sort of reconstruct the entire book that I was trying to write from what I had written, which was very useful to me because I was unable to do that at that time. <laughs> and so that was great. And, and at that point, we, we met for the first time. And she um, was finishing up her PhD at Cambridge University, where she is now um, research uh, associate at Sydney Sussex College and has worked now and published um, widely on various aspects of um, early modern diplomacy and literature, and the book trade, a number of other topics. And um, it's, it, it's a great pleasure to have her here. She's also been uh, instrumental in setting up contacts between people at Berkeley and people who are working on uh, issues of having to do with diplomacy and culture uh, in the UK. She is one of the two, um, what is the word? Uh, Co-investigators co or, funding, you know, ringleaders <laughs> of, of, a, of a research network that's been sponsored, that's being sponsored by the uh, Humanities Council in the UK on, called Textual Ambassadors, which had a, a, a workshop last summer and, and is going to have another one this spring and then a conference this summer as well. Um, and that's, I've been involved in that as have other people here, Diego, and it's, uh, uh, it's been really exciting and interesting. So it's a really a great pleasure on about three or four different levels to invite or to welcome Jo to Berkeley. And so here she is and her talk today is called Spencer's Message. Well, thanks for that lovely introduction and the invitation to speak here. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share my research and my work in progress um, with a group so well qualified to feed back on them. Um, I, I have to stress work in progress for this video camera in case the kind of record holds me forever to evolving views. Um, this is work in progress. <clears throat> um, as you've heard from Tim and you'll have seen from circulations on this talk, the main focus of my work is early modern English literature and diplomacy. Can, can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm going to start by saying a little bit about that broader context um, to put this, that broader research to put this talk in context. I'm sort of, I'm also aware that this group is potentially multidisciplinary in its makeup and broad in its interests. Um, some of you may have come for diplomacy, some of you for Spencer. So. I'm going to try and give some context here and throughout as I talk. Um, please stop me if anything's unclear, or if I'm explaining something that's already incredibly obvious to you all, and forgive any massive generalizations that are inevitable when you try and sort of condense context. With that caveat, in my work as a whole, I'm particularly interested in intersections between ideas about diplomatic representation and literary mimesis. Um, and to give a sense of how I'm using that term, mimesis, the 16th century English writer Sir Philip Sidney defines it, and by extension literary fiction, as an art of imitation or a representing, counterfeiting, or figuring forth. Moving back to diplomacy, early modern Europe saw the increasing theorization and bureaucratization of newly permanent diplomatic representation abroad in the form of resident embassies. Um, and here's an example of one 16th century diplomatic theorist who enjoyed Sydney's patronage, Alberico Gentili, defining embassy as an art of representation, as, a, as an ambassador as a representative. It's actually used as a theatrical metaphor for it, um, or a theatrical political metaphor for it. Uh, elsewhere in my work, I've argued that the correspondence of these, the, these ideas between these two men with, with connections is not a coincidence. I, I don't think it is. Um, and in his impressive work on early modern European literature and diplomacy, Tim, um, as I'm, I'm sure you all know, has established wide-ranging exchanges between these two representative arts across shared formal and semiotic concerns. But my own work in the area is distinguished by my conceptual interest in mimesis. And um, I'm also interested in how 
the material conditions, here are some material conditions, of textual and verbal exchange within early modern diplomacy and the material conditions of literary writing intersect with these conceptual crossovers between these two mimetic arts. All of these interests in mimesis and representation figuring forth and counterfeiting abstract ideals and material conditions are relevant to my work on Edmund Spencer, the 16th century English poet and Anglo-Irish settler. <coughs> Spencer's administrative career was bound up with material practices of diplomatic and quasi-diplomatic message sending. His epic poem, The Fairy Queen, explicitly engages with the diplomatically inflected literary question of how to represent both sovereignty and sovereign truths. And as I will argue here, the Fairy Queen also ponders the material problems of unreliable message sending and fears that material and earthly realities will turn any attempt at figuring forth the truth into mere counterfeiting. So with this set of concerns in mind, I'm interested in my work um, in asking what Spencer's diplomatic context tell us about his take on literary mimesis and the Fairy Queen, and what thinking about the Fairy Queen from a diplomatic perspective might tell us about the interface between English diplomacy and colonialism in this period, um, at least from Spencer's standpoint. What are my conclusions? Well, here's what I'm arguing in this talk, at least. First, um, as the context for my arguments about the Fairy Queen, I'm, I'm going to suggest that it's valuable to see Spencer's time and writing in Ireland within diplomatic as well as colonial histories. Second, I will argue that Spencer's mimetic practices and ideas in The Fairy Queen are bound up with his cynicism about the honesty and reliability of diplomatic representation, and particularly diplomatic message sending. And finally, I'm going to suggest that it's Spencer's combined poetic and political impulse to reject diplomacy as immoral and unreliable that leads him to support the military enforcement of colonial rule in Ireland. Part one, then. Part one provides some diplomatic and literary diplomatic contexts for Spencer and the Fairy Queen. And this contextual section of my talk will move fairly rapidly across three discrete categories of uh, context. First, the way in which 16th century Anglo-Irish relations were connected to diplomacy. Second, how Spencer's life and his work with letters and messages fit into that picture, or that diplomatic picture. And third, um, I'm going to just pull out some writerly, literary and poetic parallels for the problems of distant representation and unreliable message sending that characterise Spencer's experience of diplomacy. England's relationship with Ireland in the 16th century was one of violent colonialism through a series of military expeditions and a policy of English Protestant settlement culminating in the 17th century in the defeat of both the Gaelic-Irish and the earlier uh, Catholic English or Old English settlers in the country. English administrative and military engagements with the Irish inevitably involved political negotiation, and that negotiation was at the time perceived as diplomatic in character. Here again on this slide is the diplomatic theorist Gentilly citing Irish embassies to the English Queen Elizabeth I as a valid category of embassy. And these are embassies such as, uh, uh, I presume, such as Shane O'Neill's deputation to the Queen in 1562, in which he submitted to the Queen in an attempt to gain her support for his disputed claim to an Irish lordship. That's the kind of exchange I think Gentilly's talking about. Gentilly also cites with more doubt about their validity Irish embassies to Scotland, and in practice, early modern Ireland sustained extensive diplomatic relations with other European countries, and particularly France and Spain. Early modern maps, such as these, provide a good reminder that English attempts to impose imperial rule in Ireland in the 16th century, and Ireland's responses to England were inseparable from a wider network of international relations. Within the British archipelago, within the wider Atlantic world, including the Americas, and within the continent of Europe, um, as reconstructed by the new British history, Atlantic history, and now, if I might so call it, the new diplomatic history. This is, this is the earliest extent um, 
map of the British Isles as a whole, and I, I absolutely love it. I particularly love that its orientation makes us rethink the relationship between of, uh, primacy between the two countries. Um, for England, national defence was a major motivation for securing rule in Ireland. A Catholic Ireland enjoying friendly relations with France and Spain was feared to be a gateway for the invasion of England by either of these major continental fat powers, France in the mid and Spain in the late 16th century. England's actions in Ireland were driven as much by, uh, by its colonial fears, its fears of becoming um, a colonized state, as the, its hopes and dreams of uh, an empire of Ireland stretching into the new world. In their dealings with each other, both the Irish and the English manipulated diplomatic negotiation and agreement. The scene on the poster for this talk ostensibly shows Sir Henry Sidney, Lord Deputy of Ireland between 1565 and 78, negotiating with an Irish messenger, offering peace before engaging in battle with the Irish. Um, you can see it just under the central figure in, in the slide, um, Donald O'Brien, the messenger. And um, the poetic caption um, claims that, Sir, uh, I quote, Sir Henry doth prefer, um, uh, if hap to get a blessed, blessed peace before most cruel war. But the reality was different, very different. The image of Ireland, the work within which this woodcut appears, is an apology for Sydney's governance of Ireland and recounts the fate of the Irish rebel Rory Ogre Moore. To Sydney's intense irritation, Rory Ogre repeatedly broke truces he'd agreed with the English with provocation. Um, but as Sydney stepped up his pursuit of the rebel, the scene here presented as generous English diplomacy in reality depicts the lead up to the English massacre at Mullagmast of Rory Ogre's supporters who gathered under a protection for parley, an act of violence against negotiators in contravention of the law of nations. But the Queen didn't approve of Sydney's harsh tactics in Ireland, and one of the many complexities of Anglo-Irish diplomacy, if we might call it that, were the frequent divisions between the Queen and her administration in Ireland and the New English um, settler communities in Ireland as well. But this is certainly not the only example of Irish rebels breaking truces or of English violations of customary international law in Ireland in the 16th century. In this conflictual and colonial Anglo-Irish context, diplomacy functioned as a set of conventions to apply, manipulate and discard as suited to gain advantage or excuse events. As diplomacy always is, the cynical among you might be thinking, um, although not always with such bloody consequences. So how does Spencer fit into this picture? <laughs> um, uh, but then Gentili, Gentili defines ambassadors as representatives in opposition to messengers who just carry messages. But for Spencer, diplomacy and serving in Ireland were both dominated by letters, messages, and messengers. The poet was born in London in around 1552 in modest circumstances. For those of you who are not Spencerians in the room, <laughs> His education was at the Mentioned Taylor's School in London and then at Cambridge University from 1569. And that year, that same year, a bill was signed to one Edmund Spencer for carrying letters from the English ambassador to Fran in France to Queen Elizabeth, suggesting that the poet was engaged with diplomatic secretarial work from very early on in his career. After university, Spencer paired secretarial work with writing poetry and in 1580 he became private secretary to Arthur, Lord Grey of Wilton, who was appointed Lord Deputy of Ireland that year. Spencer went out to Ireland with him, and many of Grey's letters to Queen Elizabeth and her ministers are written in Spencer's hand. Here's a list of some of them in his hand. Account records show that in addition to his salary, Spencer was also paid substantial sums for carrying messages and paid messengers category that probably also included spies on Gray's behalf. In the two years that Spencer served as Gray's secretary, he seems to have paid out nearly £600 to messengers, a, a huge sum at that point. 
Spencer remained in Ireland after Lord Grey's departure in 1582 on land that he'd been granted there and spent the rest of his life among the new English Protestant settler community, serving in administrative positions and writing, as well as some shorter poetry and a treatise recommending the military and cultural subdual of the Gaelic Irish. Spencer wrote his major epic romance, The Unfinished Fairy Queen, during this period. In 1598, his estate was sacked and burned by Irish rebels, and he died in London a year later, having gone there carrying messages for the Queen um, uh, from the Protestant settler community asking for aid. The list of letters depicted on this slide give some sense, you don't have to read them, don't, don't feel obliged to read them, <laughs> uh, especially at that distance, <laughs> um, give these, this list of letters gives some sense of the efforts that went into securing correspondence. Spencer forwarded this and other checklists of sent letters to the Secretary of State to ensure that he had sef safely received all their dispatches, gesturing at the very real risks attached to sending letters and messengers, messages via messengers. Um, they didn't know they would all get there. The fragility and insecurity of paper messages and the unreliability of messengers were common problems faced both by diplomats and by administrators abroad in this period. Papers and letters that were the everyday stuff of their business, and they were often delayed, intercepted, damaged, or lost. And the oral intelligence from message bearers with which way this, they were supplemented could as easily prove misleading. Spencer certainly encountered these material problems. The letter from which this quote at the top is taken, sent by Lord Grey to the Lord Treasurer and endorsed by Spencer, apologises for an indiscretion by the bearer of a previous letter, Edward Denny, who exceeded his instructions and spoke out of turn, damaging the relationship between the two men. That's the main purpose of the letter, is to apologise for an indiscretion by a bearer of a previous letter. <laughs> In another letter, from Gray to the Queen, again written in Spencer's hand, this time he's an Italian hand. Gray appears to be taking advantage of the unreliability of message sending to pursue his own agenda in negotiations with an Irish rebel. First, he claims that he had not received the Queen's instructions before his departure to the Parley, allowing him to ignore those instructions effectively. So he, he, either, he either had received them and was lying, or, or he rushed off before he received them, which also is a at least um, a kind of um, avoidance of her instructions. Gray then takes advantage of the delayed return of the rebel's messenger, Captain Piers, who's negotiating directly with the Queen, to take his own decision about uh, Tullo um, O'Neill's petitions, and so make peace on his own terms. Right there. Here, Gray's incomplete and perhaps even false representations of the Queen intersects with the material problems of message sending, the physical distance between the Queen and her representative abroad, a physical distance that poses material challenges to letters and messengers, allows Gray personal agency in contradiction to his role as the Queen's agent. In the guide to letter writing that Angel Day published in 1586, he compared letters to messengers and to faithful and secret ambassadors because they expressly conveyed in writing the intent and meaning of one man immediately and directly to another. But the express, immediate and direct conveyance of meaning and intent was an ideal far removed from the material realities of letter sending and messengers and embassies. And that material challenge to mimetic practices is a wider literary concern. You might be thinking already, as far back as Plato in this famous passage from Phaedrus, philosophers and writers have been observing that meaning and the meaning and intent attributed to written words depends on their reader, and that writing, which cannot defend or help itself, is vulnerable both to verbal slander and to physical ill treatment. Words on paper can be weather damaged, torn up, burnt, stolen, and misread once out of their author's hand, and authors' fates befell diplomatic letters. <coughs> 
Early modern poets were aware not only that poetic writing provided a kind of mimetic parallel to diplomatic representation, but also that it suffered from the same material and readerly problems of distant and unreliable interpretation. In his verse letter to Sir Henry Wotton at his going ambassador to Venice on the slide, John Donne compares Wotton's representation of King James I to his own poetic representation, begging that Wotton allow his paper such an audience as he would ask for his embassy. Um, and we quote, after those reverend papers whose soul is our good and great king's loved hand and feared name, by which to you he derives much of his and how he may makes you almost the same. So, he, he, you know, additionally, he's saying that the, the kind of representative function is conveyed by a paper. Um, and then later in the poem, um, compares it to his own writing. Admit this honest paper and allow it such an audience as yourself would ask. And in um, another of his first letters, Dunn compares the departure of the author from his written and sent lines to the simultaneous distance and difference between a king and his ambassador. At one, uh, I quote again, at once from hence my lines and I depart, and then later in the poem, as an ambassador lies safe, howe'er his king be in danger. Spencer, I think, alludes to this separation of authorial person and intent from written words and their interpretation in the epilogue to his 1579 pastoral poem, The Shepherd's Calendar, when he writes, I quote, Go, little calendar, thou hast a free passport. He is perhaps alluding to the idea of the poetic envoy, the concluding lines of a poem that send it out into the world as an act comparable to the dispatch of a passport holding messenger, or envoyé, to use a 16th century French term for such messengers, a term that would later give us our English diplomatic envoy. But, in the second section of my talk, I want to suggest that Spencer's mimetic ideas and practices in his major epic work, The Fairy Queen, react against message sending as a communicative model. I will argue that his ideas about literary mimesis arise from his distaste for messages and messengers as unreliable, dishonest, and vulnerable to material and interpretive manipulation. Spencer's, um, I, if I'm telling you something about Spencer's, about the Fairy Queen, a, a broad introduction here, is, is that superfluous to everyone in the room? Are you all Spencer? <laughs> no. Okay, great. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, Spencer's unfinished allegorical epic romance sought to depict 12 moral and specifically Protestant virtues, each personified as a knight whose quest would span one book. Spencer only got as far as writing six books, uh, published in two installments in 1590 and 1596. It's already a pretty significant work. His poem also explicitly sought to represent and glorify Elizabeth I, although many of its depictions of the Queen end up rather problematic. With these stated moral and political aims, Spencer's poem is riddled with quasi-diplomatic questions over how poetry should represent not just the sovereign queen, but also sovereign political, religious, and philosophical ideals. The political and philosophical aspects of his epic have received considerable attention, and Andrew Hadfield, Richard McCabe, and Willie Marley, among others, have compellingly placed it within its Irish colonial context. And yet, the influence of diplomatic ideas and practices on the poem has been neglected. Um, if any of you know of some work that I've neglected, then please do tell me. <clears throat> Spencer sees sovereign philosophical truth as so perfect that it cannot be represented on this imperfect earth. <clears throat> Um, as he suggests in The Fairy Queen, the poet must enfold sovereign truth, I quote, in covert veil and wrap in shadows light, or else our, quote, feeble eyes could not endure those beams bright, but would be dazzled with exceeding light. For Spencer, sovereign truth cannot be communicated directly on this earth, only gestured at indirectly. Consequently, his allegorical poetic practice in The Fairy Queen embraces imperfection, incompletion, and obscurity, as a number of critics have argued. Mirrors are Spencer's preferred metaphor for his mimetic art within an epic that seeks to reflect sovereign truth, but through a glass, starkly. What I am arguing, then, 
is that dip, quite diplomatic and quasi-diplomatic message bearing is for Spencer the inverse of his poetic practice. Messengers and letters might claim to convey the truth clearly, unlike Spencer's poetry, but they are, in fact, unreliable, false, and immoral. Let me give you an example. The first indisputably diplomatic scene in the epic takes place at the end of book one. In that scene, the embodiment of falsehood and duplicity sends a fraudulent diplomatic letter by a messenger who embodies hypocrisy. Spencer's not really pulling his punches about diplomacy. <laughs> Duplicity, falsehood, fraud, and hypocrisy. Um, a, a lot of my, my scenes from the Fairy Queen, I'm just going to have to explain what's happening because um, there's a lot of allegorical reference. So it's a, it's a note of warning before I embark upon the first. In book one, Red Cross, the knight whose virtue is holiness, completes his quest to rescue the king and queen of Eden and, at the book's conclusion, is just about to marry their royal daughter, Una, for singular truth, when the celebrations are rudely interrupted by the arrival of a messenger. And this is the quotation on the slide. King, with great wisdom and grave eloquence, thus scan to say, but ere he thus had said, with flying speed and seeming great pretense, came running in, much like a man dismayed, a messenger with letters, which his message said. The local abruption of the king's wise and eloquent speech, underlined by midline caesura and rhetorical aposiopesis interruption, enacts in little the disruption of narrative progress towards the union of holiness and truth. By this messenger whose apparent purpose, um, seeming great pretense, apparent great purpose, already punningly reveals his deceptive nature. The letters are from Fidessa, daughter of the Emperor of the West, whose name makes a claim to faith and who writes that Red Cross is already promised to her. Red Cross and Una together reveal the falsity of that claim and the identity of the parties. First, Red Cross exposes Fidessa as Duessa, Una's false double and so the opposite of truth, the very figure of falsehood and duplicity in the epic. Then Una adds her voice to condemn Duessa's secret treasons and goes on to expose Duessa's messenger as Archimedio introduced in earlier in book one as hypocrisy, whom she describes as crafty, disguised, false, the falsest man alive, carrying vain or false letters, intended to work woe through his mistress's practic or crafty pains. Other episodes in The Fairy Queen, supported by early annotators of the book, associate Duessa with Mary, Queen of Scots, and Fidessa's letter with Catholic Mary's challenge to Protestant New England that hers was the true religion, suggesting that Archimedio might also hear reference Don Bernardino de Mendoza, the Spanish ambassador expelled for in, from England for his involvement with Mary's secret treasons, who was involved in, in Mary's plots to assassinate Elizabeth. In an affair that became a notorious English public focal point for underhand diplomatic dealings, Archimedio's message bearing for Duessa exemplifies duplicitous and hypocritical diplomacy, and it's at one extreme. But almost all the messengers, both real and metaphorical, that appear in the Fairy Queen are devious and untrustworthy, or deliver sad news, or encounter difficulties. As if, for Spencer, the business of message sending was at worst deceitful and at best grievous and plagued with problems. And so, Spencer consciously turns away from the mimetic model provided by his diplomatic work, or quasi-diplomatic work, with messengers in writing his epic poem. That point is made particularly well by his only metaphorical use of the term embassy or its variants or derivatives in the poem, despite the, men seeing, despite the poem's many diplomatic scenes and, and messengers for various reasons. He only uses the word embassy once. Um, and it occurs here. It occurs. Well, let, me, let me wait to give you that. It occurs. I'll tell you what it, the context is first. It occurs in a passage of Spencer's national epic that meditates on its classical genealogy and casts doubt on the ultimate accessibility of epic national political and poetic truth, as Elizabeth Jane Bellamy, among others, has argued. That 
episode is in Book 3, Canto 9, in which Spencer's characters retell Homeric and Virgilian epic. And as they do, one of them, Paradel, a mock epic descendant of Paris, enacts the second fall of Troy in a private courtly context by seducing his host Melbecco's wife, Helenor, whose name suggests both Helen Ur, or Helen Over Again, and Helen Hoare. Paradel begins his, this seduction with private messages of love. I quote, on her fair face so did he feed his fill and sent close messages of love to her at will. And he then continues to close or secret embassage. And again I quote, and ever and anon when none was where with speaking looks that close embassage bore he roved at her and told his secret care for all that art he learned had of yore. Nor was she ignorant of that lewd law but in his eye his meaning wisely read, and with the like him answered evermore. She sent at him one fiery dart, whose head empoisoned was with privy lust and jealous dread. Paradel and Helenor experience an ambassadorial, quasi just ambassadorial exchange that leads only to adultery and corruption. Spencer uses that exchange to comment on the vanity of attempting the poetic or wider textual verbal representation of perfect truths. As I'm going to suggest. Paradell's speaking looks evoke the comparison of poetry to a speaking picture so common in early modern poetic treatises and referenced in the proem to book three. And Paradell does indeed practice a form of artistic mimesis akin to poetry when he uses his looks to represent his mind. His visual looks have the verbal ability to speak, to tell, and to be read, like Spencer's own pictorial style of writing, which is particularly focused on the visual and the, and the kind of visual poetic technique of ekphrasis in book three. Like Spencer's poetic practice, which consciously looks to classical and medieval traditions, Paradell's speaking looks are an art he learned had of yore, that is, an art that he both studied in the past and learned from the past. And like Spencer's epic, they need to be wisely read if their meaning is to be understood. Paradell even employs a kind of allegory, an indirect, private and secret, the close, other speaking. And he goes on um, to use more explicitly symbolic gestures later in the canto. Spencer describes this mimesis as embassage, and it resonates with his poetic practice in The Fairy Queen, not just because of its um, poetry-like character or its placement within this kind of metapoetic passage, but also because embassy represents sovereignty, and so does the fairy queen. However, Paradell's quasi-poetic seduction is a parodic inversion of Spencer's educated moral poetry. His dissolute art is a corrupt contradiction a lewd law that is both an unlearned learning and an immoral doctrine. His close embassage puns on secret bussing, an archaic term for kissing, in an adulterous love that resonates with more cynical early modern perceptions of diplomacy as pimping, or perhaps here more suitably given Helenor's name, whoremongering, as Torquato Tasso admits diplomacy to be in his dialogue in Messagero. The lover's quasi-allegorical exchange tends only to a seduction belonging to the literature of courtly love that book three on the virtue of chastity explicitly combats. What's more, Paradol and Helenor find each other's symbolic guises clearly legible in striking contrast to the experience of reading Spencer's allegories. And that is the point. They're perfectly communicated and perfectly understood Quasi-diplomatic and quasi-poetic exchange leads only to transparent immorality. Paradell and Helenor enact a perverted version of a kind of diplomatic poetics within a Spencerian parody of his own literary tradition and mimetic art. They expose the vanity of attempting perfect representation, both diplomatic and literary, on this imperfect earth. section of my talk. I want to suggest that this 
combined political and poetic rejection of diplomacy as unreliable and immoral motivates Spencer's support for the harsh military enforcement of English colonial rule in Ireland. Rather well, paradoxically, ironically so perhaps, given that that position appears to us today still less moral and even less reliable. And to make that point, I want to, again, to draw on two episodes from book five of The Fairy Queen. I found that writing this talk, the density of The Fairy Queen means that it's hard to cover that much of it, even in 45 minutes. You've got four episodes in the talk. Book five <coughs> features the virtue of justice and the quest of Article, the judge of equity, accompanied by Talus, the executor of his judgments. Of all the books in the epic, Book five most closely addresses 16th century international affairs and has proved both the most stimulating and the most problematic for the critical placement of the poem in its contemporary culture. The final cantos of the book allude to the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the trial and execution of Mary Queen of Scots, England's intervention in the Netherlands, the Spanish Inquisition, the wars of religion in France and, notoriously, the conflict in Ireland. But the first episode I want to focus on occurs earlier in Book 5, when Article meets and fights with a band of Amazonian warriors, an episode that unites critique of female rule, as has often been observed, with a critique of diplomacy. <coughs> the Amazonian Amazon queen, Radigan, um, you can still all hear me over the rain, right? it's so dramatic. <laughs> um, accompaniment to my talk. Um, their queen, their, their queen Radigan, sends her messenger, Clorinda, with companions and gifts to parley with the knight and propose a personal combat. Talus conducts this deputation to Article, who, I quote, um, I'm starting part way down around here, um, as he could, then goodly well did greet, till they had told their message word by word, which he accepting well as he could weet, then fairly entertained with curtsies meet and gave them gifts and things of dear delight. Article's complacent acceptance of the parley and Radigan's terms and his generous reception of the Amazonian deputation bode ill for him in Spencer's world. Radigan wins the fight by guile and through Article's abandonment of his sword while dazzled by her beauty. She imprisons the knight dresses him in women's clothes, and gives him the domestic task of spinning. Radigan falls in love with Article and sends Clorinda again as her go-between, but Clorinda also loves Article and portrays her mistress, misrepresenting each to the other and misreporting their messages in order to keep Article imprisoned so she can keep seeing him. The night wastes away and his quest of executing justice in lo is long delayed until his eventual rescue two cantos later. As ever with the Fairy Queen, the implications of this episode are manifold and complex. But what does seem to be clear is that Article's acceptance of the parley and his engagement in diplomatic pleasantries begin its process of emasculation. The link between diplomacy and femininity, and, and su here seduction and even prostitution, has already been made by the Paradell Helenor episode and exists more widely in early modern culture within the widespread metaphorical reference to love letters, tokens, and go-betweens as ambassadors of love. The outcome of this effeminate diplomatic turn away from manly military action is the arrest of justice, defeat, and enslavement, all of which Spencer feared would be the outcome of his own female rulers' more conciliatory policies in Ireland. And at the same time, this episode, like that of Paradell and Helenor, looks to Spencer's literary heritage. The Amazon Clorinda's name recalls Clorinda, the female warrior of Tassi's epic romance, Jerusalem in Liberata, or Jerusalem Delivered, who in turn draws on other female warriors in the epic tradition. Further details attached to the incident associate Radigan with Dido and Virgil's Aeneid, and so perhaps the delay of heroic epic purpose through the intrusion of female gendered romance. I'm not entirely sure at the moment what to make of these illusions in reading the opposition of war and diplomacy in this episode, but it, it seems to me that they must present a kind of formal parallel in their, to the kind of dynamics I've been discussing, in their opposition of, ep of epic as the genre of imperial victory 
and romance as the genre of epics losers, as David Quint has argued, uh, associated with both women and with the collapse of narrative. I think that Spencer is here suggesting that diplomatic negotiation is ultimately a means of both narrative and political delay and distraction through which the English risk losing their martial purpose and becoming the effeminized and enslaved romance victims or losers of imperial epic. As Richard McKay points out, the fairy queen is motivated as much by the fear as the hope of empire, since Ireland, far from offering England a stepping stone to the new world, might easily be absorbed into the universal Spanish empire and facilitate the colonization of England. I think that's the, the kind of, uh, this is the generic kind of comment on that, on that tension. But I really would welcome suggestions from those of you with more profound knowledge of the epic tradition. Later in book five, a rescued article accompanied by Prince Arthur encounters a firm female personification of diplomacy itself, Samient, whose name signifies bringing together from the kind of um, Old English uh, Sam and Samen. Samient tells, uh, tells Article and Arthur that she's returning from the court of the Sultan, another allegory of Philip II of Spain, this time associated with an Ottoman sultan, and his wife, Adikia, or Injustice, identified by one early annotator as popery or Catholicism. So Adikia, unjust Catholicism, has been making trouble between the Sultan, Philip II of Spain, and Massilla, Elizabeth I of England. So, so as Samient informs the knights, Massilla has had tried sending Samient, or tried diplomatic means, for addressing these troubles. And I quote, Which my liege lady seeing, thought it best, with that his wife in friendly wise to deal, for stint of strife and establishment of rest, both to herself and to her commonweal, and all for past displeasures to repeal. So me in message unto her she sent, to treat with her, by way of enter deal of final peace and fair atonement, which might concluded be by mutual consent. But as Samient goes on to say, Adikia reviled and insulted her and sent her away. And I quote, All times have once safe passage to afford to messengers that come for causes just, but this proud dame disdaining all accord not only into bitter terms forth brust, reviling me and railing as she lust, but lastly to make proof of utmost shame me like a dog she out of doors did thrust, miscalling me by many a bitter name that never did her ill, no once deserved blame. Samian is clearly another of the fairy queen's materially troubled messengers, and her hostile reception may allude to Philip II's refusal to see William Ward, the envoy Elizabeth sent to explain her expulsion of Mendoza from England just before the outbreak of the Anglo-Spanish War, which is allegorized later in this canto. This Anglo-Spanish diplomatic failure marks a turning point in the three later and darker books of Spencer's epic, as the poem comes up hard against not just the inherent immoralities and unreliabilities of diplomacy, but also the difficult knowledge that England, a politically and culturally weak backwater, was losing the European diplomatic game. From this point forwards, Spencer's virtuous knights appear to feel morally justified in using diplomatic ruses themselves against the poem's quasi-Catholic figures as a means to their violent military ends. First, Article and Arthur devise a complot in which they dress Samient in a, quote, counterfeit disguise, in order to gain entry to the Sultan's court and kill him, to Adikia's despair. Samian, diplomacy, then guides the knights through an Irish-inspired landscape towards Mozilla's court, but on the way they have to pass Melengen, who personifies fraud, deceit, and guile, and through a series of illusions stands for Irish rebels. Once again, the knights use Samian, or diplomacy, as a devious means of gaining access to their enemy in order to kill him and leave him as carrion, I quote. So both agreed to send that maid of four, where she might sit nigh to the den alone, wailing and raising pitiful uproar, and as if she did some great calamity deplore. 
with noise whereof, when as the caitiff Carl should issue forth in hope to find some spoil, the inner weight would closely him and snarl. <clears throat> this whole episode moves from the inadequacies of English diplomacy in Europe to a violent and cynical solution to Irish rebellion that resonates with Spencer's notorious and horrifying views on the suppression of the Irish by the sword and starvation in his 1596 political treatise, A View of the Present State of Ireland. The heroes of that justice success genre, revenge tragedy, tragedy, end up repeating the crimes they avenge as they seek for an adequately equal punishment and so become the villain's doubles. Here, Arthur and Article, outraged by Samian's reception in Spain, match one abuse of diplomatic privileges with another in relation to Spain and entrap fraud with fraud a manoeuvre underlined by their use of a snarl or net, the emblem of guile. Spencer moves from the political and poetic rejection of diplomacy to advocating alternative military means, um, perhaps through the episode with Radigan, enables, if necessary and ironically, by diplomatic interventions. In conclusion, I have sought in this talk to trace a path from the material means of early modern diplomatic communication and representation to Spencer's mimetic practices in The Fairy Queen and back out again to the implications of his politico-poetic rejection of diplomacy for his support of an active military foreign policy. Although English interventions in Ireland moved in that direction, there's no evidence that Spencer had any particular influence on policy. But his conclusions highlight some of the important considerations that informed England's early colonial ventures and some of the important ethical dilemmas that surround diplomacy. Fear can be a powerful literary stimulus, as Richard McCabe remarks of Spencer. Spencer's epic work was motivated both by his fear of death at the hands of Irish rebels and his fear of becoming Spain's colonial subject. Fear can also be a powerful political stimulus. The Elizabethan travel and exploration writer Richard Hackley lists Spanish political and mercantile dominance within Europe among his chief reasons for advocating the English settlement of the Americas in his Discourse of Western Planting. For Spencer, and perhaps for his contemporaries, England's diplomatic weaknesses and failures within Europe fed the fears that motivated its wider military, colonial, sometimes military, colonial ventures. The views and actions fear so powerfully motivates are not that pretty, especially when they entail the wholesale rejection of diplomacy. Early modern European writings on diplomacy tend to treat it either as an idealized moral practice of peacemaking or as manipulative real politique in the state's interests. To kind of massively generalize those two categories. Yet it's Spencer's moral rejection of manipulative diplomatic practices that also leads him to reject all diplomatic routes to peacemaking. He prefers to make peace eventually through war initially. His violent conclusions prompt us to ask whether it might sometimes be better to accept some immoral means within limits for the sake of peaceful diplomatic ends. And that is a question that's just as salient today. <laughs>